<laughs> Dr. McNeil was inspired to pursue a career in global environmental cooperation by his early childhood experiences of nature on Bowen Island and by his maternal grandfather, who was a leader in international affairs with the League of Nations and the ILU, -O, which is the International Labor Organization, and who first came to Bowen in 1918. Wow. So in front of you, you have a man of many parts. Forests, climate, hunger, the environment, labor, conservation, development, indigenous people. So no wonder that the title of his presentation is so complex. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it doesn't give you anything. But I, I have a feeling that this will be the, the first of many presentations from Charles McNeil. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Hilary. And, uh, such a pleasure and honor to be with this group and it's really interesting I was saying to somebody that I spent more time since you called me a week or so ago thinking about this talk than I did preparing for a presentation to a thousand religious leaders representing a billion people from 125 countries. <laughs> <laughs> so, so but, but that's not to raise expectations because I've never done this talk before and I really don't know how it's going to go down and I, I welcome the chance to kind of think about new things I, it's a little bit of a pain to do new things all the time, but that's what I'm doing here. So I think it's of interest. Um, and I wanted to say that there'll be a lot of uh, small print. Um, and if those of you on the back you know, can't quite see, there are two seats here, three seats here. And so feel free to come up. And, uh, and also, if I <coughs> talk too fast um, or something, wave and tell me to slow down or shut up or whatever you want to do. But um, I may have bitten off more than I can chew here, but this period of time is so exciting, I just can't believe what's going on. I mean, it's also tragic and terrible in the worst way as well. Um, but thanks to the Rotary Club, everywhere I go in the world, I see Rotary Club members and projects and so on. So I've always wondered, who are those people? So I'm so glad to, to meet you and to have a chance to speak to you. And I've also, all my life, been impressed with Bowen Island as a center of of activism and, and thinking globally and, and acting locally. Uh, I, I wasn't the one who first came here in 1918. That was my grandfather. <laughs> <coughs> um, but I did come here in 1954. And, and I'm going to show you a picture of that in a moment. Um, so the purpose, from my perspective, of this talk is to really share some perspectives as someone who started life here and I spent 30 years in international development elsewhere, and now I'm back. I came back at, at uh, COVID, brought me back, and, and I'm actually here. Um, and, and I want to think with you at, I'm going to lay out some issues, like there's some really serious issues to deal with in the world, and I mean really serious, in addition to the one we're seeing on television every day. Um, and I want to think with you about what we can do in our own lives, in our own community, in the province, and in the country. Um, so. Um, so I valued this opportunity to think about this. But there are eight things that happened in the last few months that have come together in a really interesting way. And I'm going to try to make sense of them a little bit. The first was last summer on Bowen uh, in BC, the forest fires, the extreme temperatures. Remember on June 27th, the little town of Lytton registered the highest temperature in the history of this country. And then two days later, it burned to the ground. And then uh, did you, and you watch these, the, the floods, uh, also during the summer, the, the die-off of millions of mussels. We're going to talk about the die-off of other species, but we've seen it right here with our own eyes. Um, and then the, the floods and the, and, the, and the winter. So that's one thing. The second is, last November, I went from here to Glasgow, uh, uh, Scotland. <clears throat> and that was just three months ago. And that was the most important climate uh, meeting since Paris, and I'm going to say a little bit about that. Uh, the third thing is just a month ago, you, Russia invaded Ukraine, upending the world order, shaking us all up. Um, that's tied to what I'm about to talk about. Four days later, four days later on February 28th, exactly one month from today, the most shocking intergovernmental panel on climate change report ever published came out, and I'm going to tell you what it says. Number five, also last month, 
a landmark study was released showing how publicly funded environmentally harmful subsidies to the tune of $1.8 trillion a year are driving climate change and the destruction of species. $1.8 trillion that you and I pay for with public money are going to the wrong place for the wrong thing. That report came out at the same time. Number six, last week, March 20th, weather stations in Antarctica and the Arctic showed freakishly hot temperatures, 40 degrees uh, Celsius above normal in the South Pole, Antarctica. 30 degrees above normal. This is counts Celsius, you know? I usually think in Fahrenheit, this is Celsius. That would be 70 and 50 uh, above normal in the Arctic. Number seven, just last week, the Global Alliance for the Future of Food launched a major effort, and I'm gonna rely on Mr. Hassan here uh, when I get to that part, uh, an effort to embed the food system transformation into the global climate agenda. Very important consequences there. The last thing is yesterday, yesterday the uh, Vancouver Sun published uh, the, the, the plan by Metro Vancouver to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030. So all these things are happening. Eight things happened in the, since, since you, basically since Hillary called me I've had to make sense of all these eight things. So, so, so these are important and, and, and also I just want to put this in context. The last two years have been hell, right, with COVID. Do you realize that in the year 2020, fossil fuel pollution killed three times more people than died around the world from COVID? Three times more people every year die, that's about eight million, die every year from pollution from the way we make our energy. And, and one other thing to know, did you notice that when governments want to, they can allocate trillions of dollars with the flip of a switch, the snap of their fingers. Trillions of dollars. So when governments get, the, the, get the, want that, they can do that. Let's keep that in the back of our mind as we talk about the rest of this. So um, as Hillary said, I, my interest in nature and in international affairs started right here, up the road at the end of Mount Gardner Road. Uh, since the age of two, I was fascinated with my pet garter snakes. I've always loved snakes and I learned to love them here and the forests and the ocean. And my grandfather, I'm going to show you a picture, uh, represented Canada, the League of Nations, and he was the first professor of history in the history of UBC. He taught there from, um, from 1915 to 1925. And uh, my grandmother, I'm going to show you a picture. Antonia La Francoise Larie Eastman was Parisian and she was an accomplished painter. They came here, they bought a place for $350 at uh, <laughs> end, end of Mount Gardner Road and I inherited it. That's why I'm, I'm here. I'm a dual citizen now, US and Canada. So let me, uh, this is really a strange way to start a serious presentation, but here are some family photos. <laughs> <laughs> next, next slide. I wanted to say a little bit about what Glasgow really meant. Um, I also wanted to talk about this report that just came out uh, less than a month ago, and it's just sh shocking. Uh, I also that this is the only relatively original part of this, and that is <clears throat> what we can learn from the Ukraine invasion to 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 uh, you know inform us going forward. And then this environmentally harmful subsidies. I wanted to on what's the word, unpack a little bit what I said about the $1.8 trillion of wasted money going to the wrong things. And then the last thing is, is just you know, the importance of transforming the food system. It's a less, not so often talked about. Um, and then what can we do? I've just done a couple of slides for what can we do as individuals, as communities, as a province, and, and as Canadians. Okay, next slide, yeah, God pray. To be. This is okay, okay. While, while he's doing that, let me say a little bit of setup. Um, in my lifetime, I just realized that in my lifetime, I've seen the population of, of the Earth grow from 2.6 billion when I was born to 7.9 billion now. That's exactly a three-fold. So in my lifetime, I've seen the population of this Earth triple. In the same period, uh, of, of massive global impact, this 
this new period of geologic era has a name. It's called the Anthropocene. Can you imagine? So that, and it began in 1950. The Holocene was the last 11,000 years uh, since glaciers were about as high as Cypress Mountain. That's, you know, we had a mile of, of snow above our head 11, 12,000 years ago. But in, since 1950, the new geologic era is, called, is now called scientifically the, Anthrop the Anthropocene. And it began in 1950 with a great acceleration, a dramatic increase in human activity and consumption, eclipsing the Industrial Revolution. When humankind has caused massive extinctions of plants and animals, polluted the oceans, and altered the atmosphere, and uh, and and so we have our own our own geologic period. In my lifetime, it's overlapped with that. So I, I've really overlapped with a lot of change, and I'm wanting to now use time in my life to figure out what can we learn from this and how we can we chart a new trajectory. And as I said, I've, um, Let's see, uh, I may have bitten off more than I could chew. Okay, so my uh, career at the UN began exactly 30 years ago, just before the Rio Earth Summit uh, in 1992. And that was a turning point in, in international environmental cooperation. And that was organized by a great Canadian called Maurice Strong, who I, I knew very well. Did anybody know Maurice Strong? You know of him? Great, okay. Um, so uh, over, I won't say anything, but what I've done over the last 30 years. We just heard about it. OK, so um, uh, last comment before I go here is that when I started at the UN 30 years ago, we knew everything we needed to know to make change. And I just realized that 30 lost years, it's so frustrating when I think about it. When I started at the UN, we knew climate change was real. We knew it was going to threaten life. And then when I read this report over the last three days ago, god damn it. You know, that is infuriating. So um, I want to turn this anger into something productive uh, through this discussion here. OK, um, uh, this is my grandfather. He, he was, he's, he's listed right here, Mac Eastman. This is the British Columbia reinforcing platoon, the 196 uh, uh, Western Universities Overseas Battalion. So he went from UBC into World War I and ended up being a, a captain and so on. Next slide. And look, there he is. I found these postcards. A couple of years ago when my father died, I went through every piece of paper in the house, and I found all the hundreds of, of photographs. These are photographs uh, of what of, of happened to my grandfather. In, uh, this happened to be uh, Christmas time in 1917 in a little village. I looked this up today. This village is, is somewhere in France. And, um, and here's, a, here's, a, here's a letter he wrote to my grandmother. on. Um, on uh, March 28, 1918. And this was in 1917. So it's just fascinating to see this stuff. OK, next slide. This it has no redeeming value other than the fact that this reminds me of what's happening in Ukraine. When I saw this, I go, holy, to, holy crap, this is, this is the kind of devastation that's happening there. These, uh, there's a whole series of photographs my grandfather took of Europe. Um, and there he is in, with his platoon. Um, next slide. And look, here he is at the end of Mount Gardner Road. <laughs> and, and Catherine Shaw is, recognizes this well, but this was uh, April and May 1917. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and there he is. This is where I, I, I live now. And he was, uh, um, an, uh, um, that was, apparently he got injured during World War I and he came there to recuperate. And that's when he looked over and saw the piece of land and bought it. And all the neighbors, my mother said, made fun of him because didn't that poor old fool know he can't grow turnips on that land? Well, it's true. He can't grow turnips there. But, but I'm glad he got it anyway. So, <coughs> so, so here's my grandmother. Oh, that, uh, here's my grandmother, Antonia. Look at this, on the same site. And here with my mother on her lap, and this is the same place where I go every day. Um, 1921, this was in 1921, and this is 1922. On the back, they have the dates. Next slide. Look at this. Bliss Carman, I didn't know who he was, but I was told he was a very famous Canadian poet. Um, he visited Bowen. He was a friend of the parents and the family. And here's my mother sitting on his lap in 1922 on the same point where I just came from 10 minutes ago or 20 minutes ago. 
Um, next slide. I, I, I was astonished when I was digging through my family. I found this newspaper article. This newspaper article is a picture of my mother sitting on the lap of Liz Carmen, and it was for some unknown reason published in the Vancouver Sun, the Toronto Globe, and the Montreal Gazette on, on uh, March 1st, 1923, exactly 100 years in one month. Isn't that interesting? It's like 100 years in one month ago. And I was so uh, surprised to, to see this um, and to find this. So my mother's famous. She was uh, on all the newspapers. And, and then, look at this. That's me. Um, and uh, Levin and Judith are ice swimmers. They taught me how to swim in the cold water. Uh, but I was an early ice swimmer there at the age of uh, four. This was in 1956. We, we stayed at Enswell Farm. And this is when I got interested in, in snakes. Love my love of snakes. Here's a snake skin with my twin brother and I examined. So that's, that's, uh, so that's my history on Vaughan Island. I have hundreds of photos, but I promise not to show them to you. Next slide. So what happened in, in Glasgow? Um, this, I, I wrote a, a piece for the undercurrent in December, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna repeat it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a few things. Next slide. Yeah, okay, so those of you back there, if you don't have telephoto, <laughs> if you don't have, if you don't have, uh, uh, binoculars for eyes, I, I'll, I'll summarize. So I think the bottom line here, Glasgow was important. Some important things happened, but not nearly enough to make the difference. The curve was bent in the right direction, but not far enough. One of the things that struck me the most, starting 30 years ago with the real Earth Summit, and now 30 years later, this was the most dynamic expression of civil society, business, indigenous people, women, uh, young people. It was, I was given hope. There's an explosion of creativity, of compassion, of commitment, and effective strategic engagement. That's happening in the world. And that, that thread is making a difference. It needs to be translated into action by government to make the critical difference. Also, um, importantly, governments committed to the 1.5 degrees centigrade. In Paris, governments didn't think they could do it. It's now clear that without that, we're, we're really toast. So governments hunkered down and said, we're going to do that. But perversely, when you add up all the commitments that they made, you end up with a future of 2.4 degrees centigrade. So that's the disconnect that we're having to deal with. The world, uh, you know, they're committed down, they have political will, but it doesn't yet translate into the action that's needed. The other thing happened is that an understanding that by 2050, we have to be net zero. That means for every bit of burning we do, we have to either offset it or, or, or sequester it, but we have to, or, or stop it. So by 2050, life has to look very different than right now. And by 2030, that's just seven years and nine months away, it has to look very different than now too. It has to be halfway there. So that's really a little bit staggering, but, but I'm gonna argue that it shouldn't be too, uh, it shouldn't, it's not impossible. Another thing that happened is, <clears throat> it was really surprising. For the first time in history, it may seem crazy, but for the first time in history, governments committed to phasing, not out, but phasing down coal and phasing out perverse subsidies. That language had never occurred in the last 30 years. Suddenly, that dirty little secret that subsidies and coal and oil have to go finally made it onto Broadway finally made it into the public eye. That was, that was very significant. I'm gonna say more about that. And then um, they also agreed that every year they're gonna report back, not every five years. In Paris we said, hey, see you in five years. But be, since we have to do so much between now and 2030, you can't do it every five years. Um, and then Canada did a whole lot of things. I was pretty impressed with my, my new country, Canada. I just got my citizenship a few months ago. Um, <coughs> turns out I've been a Canadian all my life. I just didn't know it. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so uh, Canada made lots of commitments about, about coal, cutting methane, uh, aligning trillions of dollars investments and so on. So Canada was very progressive and, and, and my take home message, we now need to hold Canada's feet to the fire to deliver on these commitments. Uh, and then the important, 
thing for me was the Glasgow Leaders Pledge on Forest and Land Use. I've been focusing on forests for 15 years now, like, like, like a laser, and, and I was impressed the way 141 countries did something better than I arranged in 2014. So I was humbled, but impressed. And $19 billion assigned came with it. So, so that's kind of, from my sense, some important things happened. Lots didn't happen. The rich countries were not generous enough. Next slide. Um, interestingly, this is in Glasgow. There's a building called the Armadillo, for obvious reasons. And each night, they would, uh, uh, civil society people would, would project messages like, restore our forests, empower indigenous peoples, uh, 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 plant-based diets, shift to plant-based diets. I'm going to get to that, too. So that was interesting. Next slide. Uh, I made the mistake of picking up the phone at 2.30 in the morning when I was dead asleep, when I just arrived in Glasgow. And it was this guy from the BBC saying, hey, uh, the leaders just made a big commitment. What do you think about it? So I was taken a little bit off guard, but people say I did OK. But I was, I was in a dead sleep. It was a private number. My, I think, should I or shouldn't I answer it? And they said, you're going live in 10 minutes. Get, get, get dressed and uh, turn on a light. I said, oh my god. <laughs> so, so I had to respond to, to that, that thing. But uh, m message itself, don't answer the phone if, you, if you're sleeping and it's, and it's a private number. So, but, uh, but it was a good chance to actually give a positive message. I said, on behalf of the UN, we fully endorse these kinds of commitments. They need to do more of it. Next slide. OK, so now, this intergovernmental panel report just came out uh, exactly a month ago today. Look what the Secretary General said about it. I've seen many scientific reports in my time, but nothing like this. Today's IPCC report is an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. The world's biggest polluters are guilty of arson of our only home. That's pretty powerful. That doesn't sound like a diplomat, does it? it, it that's, he, he's not mincing words there. Um, so, so that's a, a setup for, for what we're going to see. Next, next slide, please. So key findings. Um, and I, in, in my other presentation that I was doing in my head that I'm not doing today, I unpacked all of these six points. But I'll just go over them briefly. One is uh, the conclusion is, the impacts are already more widespread and severe than we ever predicted. What's really perverse also about this is that the IPCC started in 1988. It's a group of thousands of scientists from all countries in the world. And they do reports, and they usually have to argue about them and argue. And so um, everybody thought that these reports, uh, and, and have been accused of being uh, sort of over the top, uh, uh, too negative, too, too, you know, too strong a statement. It's turning out, it's the reverse. They've been, they've been underestimating. They've been underselling what's really happening. And that's finally clear. Number two, that we're locked into much worse <coughs> impacts than we're seeing already. We're seeing a lot already. And I forgot to do that whole part about what are you seeing. Damn. OK, we'll come back to that. Um, um, but we're locked into, because of the, the greenhouse gases that are already out there and the system happening, we're locked into a deadly future. It's, I don't know, there's a good analogy. Like you put on the brakes, you thought you've stopped, and you're on the ice, and you just keep, keep floating. Um, the next is the risks will, um, will escalate. If we go beyond 1.5, that's already a mess. You go beyond beyond that, and then the, it's sort of the, it's 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 even way more severe. Inter you know, for countries where there's inequity, where there's conflict, where there's development challenges, where there's governance challenges, their vulnerability. It's now being seen that their vulnerability is like 15 times greater than a country that's more stable. This is a piece of of insight that has not been documented before. Um, number five. Adaptation is crucial, that, that there's a lot of plans out there, but a tiny fraction of what really needs to be done. And then the last one, that a lot of what's happening is too severe to adapt to. In other words, when there's sea level rise and communities have to leave or countries have to leave, that isn't something you recover from. That's a loss and a damage, meaning we're going to need to deal with that. that. That hasn't been grappled with by the international community. Next. Next slide, please. So a couple of points. 
everywhere is affected. There's not a habited region on, work, on Earth that's escaping the impacts. Um, half the population, that's 3.3 to 3.6 billion people already live in areas highly vulnerable. Half the human population lives in places highly vulnerable. That millions of people already face food and water shortages, even at the current uh, uh, level of heating. That, um, that massive die-off of species are happening. We saw it here on Bowen. Did you remember the smell when the millions of mus mussels were dying? Um, that, uh, that we're seeing that, uh, not to mention that, but actual extinction. There's, there's, there's documented extinction happening. And then um, this 1.5, it, it constitutes a critical level beyond which um, uh, things are likely to become irreversible. And then coastal areas, I put this point in because of, we're an island, but islands are facing flooding at temperatures uh, now, but, but even more so. So um, next slide, the, well, this is the last one of, of details, but I, I couldn't, this was just before coming over here, I said, but I, I gotta get these points across. Uh, so 20 million people have been forced from their homes each year since 2008 by floods and storms connected to climate change. You know that issue of attributing, uh, of attri attribution of which events, you can't necessarily uh, uh, pin a particular event to climate change, but now the science of is getting so much more better, so, so much better that we now know 20 million people a year are being knocked out of their homes by, by climate induced floods. Crop product productivity growth in Africa shrunk by a third since 1961 in, in Africa. Half the global population faces water insecurity at least one month per year. Uh, that's a little hard for people living on Bowen, the, the, the rainiest part of the world, but to know that, that really half the population is, is water insecure at least a month. Um, that climate change will drive 32 to 132 million more people into extreme poverty in the next decade um, alone. That in highly vulnerable nations, mortality from these events is 15 times greater than in, in, in countries that are more stable governance. Indigenous peoples, and this is really perverse, I work a lot of, with indigenous people and have for 20 years or more, that, that their livelihoods depend on the agriculture, the fishing, the tourism. They are likely to be forced out of their homes. They're the ones holding the line on the climate by protecting the Amazon, but they're going to be among the first to be pushed out unless we, 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 we deal with this. Next slide. So we, I won't go into this, but just to say that uh, studies have done showing what does the world look like at 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial level? What does it look like at two degrees, three degrees? And what's the difference? And what this allows us to do is to say, for example, uh, biodiversity loss will be uh, twice as great if we get to three degrees. That, that uh, fires will be three times worse uh, from 1.5 uh, if, if we, um, than at three degrees and so on. So it's just, it's an interesting way to kind of see, see what droughts, floods, fires, um, extreme heat, sea level rise, and, and biodiversity loss. It's a way to assess the impact of climate change uh, across these different scenarios. Next slide. So <coughs> the bottom line is, the science is unequivocal. If anybody says to you, oh, the science is not clear of this or this, this you know, it's disagreement, just strangle them, please. <laughs> that, that really, that put them out of the misery. That is, just does not belong in this world anymore. Um, the science is unequivocal. Um, and delayed action will make it even worse, will make a world unrecognizable. The next few years offer a very narrow window uh, to, to, to turn this around. And changing course will require immediate, ambitious, and concerted efforts to slash emissions. Um, and turning this around is not going to be easy. It's going to take a village. Uh, it's going to take government, civil society, private sector, and everyone. So, uh, and this report really says there's no alternative. So, um, next slide. Uh, this is what we saw, right, last summer, uh, with just 1.1 degrees. I forgot to mention that. We're at 1.1 degree above pre-industrial. We, we need to have a hard stop at 1.5. So you'll see how, how dire this is. Next slide. Okay, back, back one slide before, before I change. So um, bottom line is, 
uh, when Hillary called, I hadn't read this thing yet. So, so I go, what am I going to talk about? And then I just started flipping through things. I go, oh my god, I need to let people know about, about this report. OK, so um, next slide. Now for how this all ties together with Ukraine. Um, so look at this. This is Christiana Figueres. She was the former head of the climate secretariat. Uh, she's a friend of mine from Costa Rica. And I just was struck by what she said. The atrocities in Ukraine have been financed by our addiction to oil and gas. We can and must tackle both the acute and the chronic crises together. I gather what she means by the chronic meaning protecting and sending support to Ukraine and the, uh, uh, the acute and the chronic being, being the climate change. So the war provides a whole new compelling rationale uh, for getting off of oil. Um, and, and you know, oil is concentrated in places around the world. And whoever happens to be controlling that geography has an inordinate amount of power. Look what you have. Putin here, you have Saudi Arabia, you have the Koch brothers, you have Chevron. These terrible people have way more power than they deserve. And that's because that's one more downside to this, this addiction that we have. 60% um, of all of Russia's input comes from oil and gas. And without that, they can't finance their war, they can't equip an army, and they can't intimidate Europe any further. So the good news is, so there is good news, I'm not just a uh, Harvard New York terrible news, the good news is is that we don't have to tolerate this crap anymore. That over the last 10 years, the price of renewable energy has dropped 90%. It's now the cheapest power on earth. And this transition is not gonna be easy, but look what the alternative is, to call that easy. That's, a, that's an ugly alternative. So it's very much like a drug addiction. We're a human species addicted to a terrible drug. Um, and look what the American Petroleum Institute is doing about this. They're saying, let's, we'll solve this problem with Ukraine. We'll just pump more oil. And then others say, let's just drill more things. Let's take the next 10 years and drill more. So uh, even uh, Jason Kenney, the uh, premier of Alberta, was down in, in, in Houston last week saying, please, buy from us. We're better than Putin, but not a lot better. You know, it's the same addiction, and it's, it's people like them that are keeping this addiction going. So, and they've used uh, their money, their ill-begotten money, to buy governments. Uh, in the US, it's unbelievable. It's um, the entire, now I'm, I'm not speaking as a UN here, okay? Um, so the entire Republican Party is bought uh, whole, uh, wholly by the um, oil companies. And, um, and in Canada, I didn't follow it very closely, but I, I imagine with the previous administration, there was also influence. So, um, there, so we have to, you know, it's wrong to say, let's produce more oil to solve this problem. Um, and the way to stand up to Putin is to get off of oil. So, um, so I'm saying that this is kind of an inflection point. This is a, a, a transformational moment. And we're not going to get a lot more of these in the next seven years and nine months. So I'm hoping we'll use this moment. Uh, Canada's Environment Minister, Stephen uh, uh, Guibault, has been very clear about uh, the need to get off of fossil fuel and onto renewables. Um, and Canada has uh, a lot of sun and wind. But you know, next door, they have a hell of a lot of fossil fuel reserves. Apparently, there's 167 thousand trillion watts of, uh, of oil reserves. That, that's more than you can imagine, right? Um, but interestingly, so that's 167 petawatts. Canada also has 71 petawatts of renewable energy, not even counting hydro. So with wind and solar, Canada has 71, which means that in two and a half years, Canada would be producing more energy from renewable than all the oil it's ever had. So, so that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> and if, if we were to double down on exploiting the 173 billion barrels of oil in the ground, uh, that would actually heat the planet a full half a degree by itself. So that would bump us from 1.1, which is, we're close to 1.2, that would be 1.7 overnight. And that's from a population of Canada, which is one half of 1% of the world's population. I don't think the rest of the world's going to like that. 
right? So we can't do that. We, we can't do that. It's that simple. Um, so wars have to be fought on many fronts. One front is, is, is what you see on TV. The other front has to be this, um, the transformation of, of, of the economy. And I was reading about how in the Second World War, Canada and the US reconfigured their economies dramatically and drastically. Um, and, uh, and the US at one point was producing, a, I think, a, a bomber every hour. And, and, and that's a complicated piece of machinery. Uh, a lot more complicated than a solar panel. So, so um, I think the potential to shift our economy is there. It's going to take something, but as I said, the al alternative is even uglier. The Institute for Economics and Peace predicts that we could see a billion refugees from climate change over the next decades, a billion. That's 300 or 400 times more than the 3 million refugees you're seeing now in Ukraine. Imagine, how is the planet going to deal with 300 times worse uh, migration refugee issue than we're seeing right now. So this could be our last chance to really do something good about it. Just a few final words about energy. Photovoltaic panels are very efficient, um, uh, and the wind turbines are also very effective. They can cool and heat our homes, cook our food, power cars, bikes, and buses. The conventional wisdom was that they're unreliable, that the sun goes down and comes up, the winds come and go. The truth is, though, uh, that's now with low cost, the, 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 the plummeting cost of batteries, that that problem is being solved. And in fact, um, uh, several countries already get over 90% of their oil from, from renewable sources, Iceland, Costa Rica, Namibia, and Norway. Um, so it can be done. Um, solar panels, the price is going down 10% a year. Uh, renewable energy is already cheaper than fossil. So it can be done, not going to be easy. Um, it would be difficult if everybody were operating in good faith, but that's not the case. And I just read last night about Joe Manchin, the Democrat. My God, he gets more money from the oil uh, industry than anyone else in the Senate. And there was a New York Times midnight last night. I'm thinking, what am I going to talk about today? And I see Joe Manchin article, New York Times. He's literally getting. Uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars and it's all been hidden from the coal industry. Can you imagine one guy stopping the entire largest economy in the world, the US, from the Build Back Better uh, 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 legislation that would invest billions of dollars into renewable energy in this transformation. <laughs> one guy in the pocket of the oil industry is stopping the whole world from moving this forward. I could hardly sleep when I read that. but. But uh, so we deal with, you know, with special interests. That's part of our jobs to deal with that. Um, natural gas is being promoted as a bridging fuel. A fuel. It's a bridge to nowhere. Uh, there's so much um, uh, lo uh, uh, um, large quantities uh, escape um, from the fracking. It's it's uh, it's really not a viable option for lots of reasons. Uh, burning wood, and, and so this LNG thing and house sound, we've got to kill that thing. Uh, there's all these wood burning plans, biomass, that's, that's not going to work either because that's based on the assumption that you can burn it now and then grow it later. But if you burn it now, that's the pulse going into the atmosphere that we can't afford. So, so that's, I say, the burning wood is crap also. That's not a viable option. Um, and then ca carbon capture and sequester stuff, these, these very complicated things, none of that's been working so far. And why bother when it's so expensive uh, anyway? Nuclear is something that we environmentalists are really having to wrap, wrap our heads around. I've you know, spent years opposing and so on. I think maybe in this interim period, we might have to live with some nuclear. That's, that's something we can talk about. Um, and then wind energy, we're going to have to have our landscapes have a bunch of those for this to work. And, and we have to get off of uh, biofuels. Ethanol is incredibly inefficient and a terrible way to use land and to bump up food costs. So, so the transformation of the, food, of the energy system is possible, is doable, and that's the new front on the war that I'm arguing we have to uh, uh, unleash. So, uh, so that's it on that topic. Next slide. Only four to go. <laughs> um, Don't and worry, I, I, Charles. We have time. Okay. We just need to okay. All right. It's um, too interesting. Okay, well, that, that, um, so uh, this, this environmentally harmful subsidies, uh, 
very fascinating report that just came out. I, I, something I've been paying attention to for, t for 25 years, watching, wondering when is it we're going to get enough information. The problem with these subsidies is they're usually done kind of secretly. They're, 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 there's not a lot of information. You get companies that get the money can't, don't usually divulge it. So it's, uh, it's not easy to understand it. But, but now the, the, the sort of the story is becoming more clear. And as I said, in Glasgow, it would it was fingered directly. We have to get rid of these subsidies because what's happening is billions of dollars is being spent mainly in fossil fuels, agriculture, and water industries um, to basically do the wrong thing, to overuse or misuse. Same thing with, with pesticides and fertilizers. Oftentimes these subsidies start off as a good idea. Let's help people. And then they, they, it's like a drift net that, that's, that's left out in the ocean, killing fish for no benefit to anybody. That's, that's what these uh, subsidies are like. Um, and so it really need to um, uh, repurpose them, uh, either redirect them, repurpose, or better eliminate a lot of these things. Uh, if they could be, um, if that could be done, we're talking about a tremendous amount of money. Uh, oftentimes the same businesses that say, oh no, we don't have enough money to solve that problem, uh, don't, don't acknowledge that if we were to direct even a portion of those I illegitimate subsidies to solving the problem instead of creating the problem, we would, we would have a, a way forward. Uh, next slide. Uh, so. Uh, I had thought my organization had estimated the fossil fuel subsidies at 423 billion a year. It's actually more like 640, and this is surely an underestimate. Uh, subsidies for agriculture industry, 520 billion. Um, financing unsustainable agriculture practices, is that soil erosion, water pollution, commodity-driven deforestation, and so on. And then for uh, water, it's about 350 billion. Uh, to going for unsustainable use of water. So, um, next slide. And, and here's a, a little summary of that. You'll see that there are subsidies to be dug into fossil fuels, agriculture, water, forestry, uh, construction, transport, and marine capture fisheries. The closer you look, there's all kinds of, of things going on that need attention. Um, and what the good news is, is that um, businesses are getting very much on board with this struggle to clear this up. Um, that Paul Pullman is the former CEO of, of Unilever and somebody I know well and a great guy and, and, and he, he, he's really uh, on board here. Some 800 companies lobbied the G70 last year, the G20 last year to get them to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. So businesses are getting on and that's a very, very, very positive thing. When the businesses themselves start to blow the whistle on bad behavior like this, then we've got somewhere. Paul Pullman said, um, we're often told there's no money to tackle these problems, yet just a third of the money could be redirected towards making our food system sustainable, the same food system which is otherwise responsible for a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's time to stop the self-serving, short-sighted lobbying that perpetuates damaging subsidies. That's from a business leader. He's an amazing guy, uh, Paul Pullman. I could say more about this, but I won't right now. Okay, next, last sort of substantive point. Um, and this is where I'm going to need Hassan's help, I think. Um, and, and I think uh, another very important thing, the Global Alliance for the Future of Food just last week launched a big campaign and where they're making it known that uh, our food system needs help. Our food system is producing a third of all the, all the greenhouse gases come from our food system. Most of it, the really dirty little secret is that most of it is from animal protein. Uh, the US, in fact, 82% of all the greenhouse gases in the US come from animal, uh, uh, animal uh, uh, protein. So, um, but, oh, oh, compressed zip files there. Um, so, um, food, so food production, processing, distribution, consumption, and waste account for a third of all the greenhouse gases. It's, it's 20% of, of the solution of the, of the problem can come from three things. One is making our food production system more uh, sustainable and, um, and, uh, and efficient. The second is reducing a waste. A third of all the food that we grow is wasted. 
can imagine the greenhouse gas, the loss of resources, the water, the energy, all of that lost. A third, so reduced waste. And the third is shifting to, plant, to more plants and less animals. It's incredibly important. I'm, I've become kind of a, an advocate for that from my personal life, um, uh, seeing what, it's a lo long story, but I just uh, discovered the incredible personal health benefits. And then uh, the more I look into it, the, the climate, the biodiversity benefits are absolutely convincing. I, I, think, I think we all need to look at eating more plants and fewer animals. Um, and, and there's no way to reach this 1.5 without transforming the food system. That topic would be one of many, many lectures, and I wouldn't be the one giving them. I think Hassan and, and his colleagues would be giving them, but I just wanted to get it on the table here that, that uh, you know, changing the dietary habits of consumers in developed countries uh, by reducing animal uh, products would, would go a long way to improving our health, reducing the pressure on land, water, biodiversity, and the climate system. Um, and if we were to shift to plant-based diets, this is a little extreme, but it happens, I believe it's true, that we could reduce the land use uh, of the land used by food up to 76%. So we could dramatically reduce the amount of land we need for food if we eat more plants and, and fewer animals. Um, and uh, let's see what else they want to see about that. Uh, next slide. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here's to, not to drive the point too deep, but just a couple of things. Industrial agriculture. Um, is responsible for almost a third of global methane emissions. Methane is one piece of the equation. Uh, about a third of it comes from animals. Uh, changing the dietary habits of those of us in the north by reducing the demand for animal products would improve health and reduce the pressure. As I said, um, it could reduce the land use of food by up to 76%. I guess I just said that. Um, also, the connection with, with uh, with COVID, there's a strong connection with uh, zoonotic diseases. The more we press into, and the more we degrade wild areas, the more in contact we come with diseases. That there's a strong connection between our lifestyle and the next, the next uh, infectious disease. Um, and so the bottom line here, and it's something which may be my next career after I finish with this interfaith work, is to get get this food system onto the climate agenda. Uh, 15 years ago when I started, the forest issue was not considered in the climate context, nor were indigenous people's rights. Now they're in there. This is the next frontier, getting the food system transformation in the heart of the, of the climate debate and the, and the climate negotiations. Okay. Um, Hassan, anything to add? Or, uh, I, I think you've got enough on the table. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, next, next slide. I can't remember what's there. Hard yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever it is, I'm, I'm ready for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> are okay. we ready for that? Okay, yeah, are we? So, so what do we do about this? Now we're into the what do we do about this. And I was really struck by Naomi Klein. She's at UBC. She's a filmmaker, although she's married to Avi Lee, uh, Lewis. Uh, I'm, I know his, his father, the UN, Canadian ambassador to the UN for many years. So. I'll just read what she says, because I really think it's powerful. The hard truth is that environmentalists can't win the emission reduction fight on our own. Winning will take sweeping alliances beyond the self-identified green bubble with trade unions, housing rights advocates, racial justice organizers, teachers, transit workers, nurses, artists, and more. But to build that kind of coalition, climate action needs to hold out the promise of making daily life better for the people who are most neglected right away. Not far off in the future. Green, affordable homes and water, that's, that's safe to drink is something people will fight for a hell of a lot harder than carbon pricing. So I, I think that as we now turn to uh, you know, what we're going to do about all this, this idea of, of broad-based coalitions, unlikely uh, uh, coalitions is, is very important. OK, next slide. Please. What can we do about it? Um, now. I just threw up, uh, not threw up, but put up uh, 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 a, few, a few points based, and I'm just maybe going to go through them quickly. Uh, national, province, community, and individual. That's the last thing I have to say, are these things. We have time. Okay, okay, good. I've, um, so national level. Uh, one obvious thing is to use this post-COVID Build Back Better funds uh, and other resources to transition off of fossil fuels, to do what we talked about get the hell off of fossil fuels and use 
the funds for that. Number two is to re redirect, repurpose, eliminate fossil fuel subsidies and other environmentally harmful. And, and as I said, the trillions of dollars spent on propping up polluting technology can be directed to stimulate growth, innovation, and health. And then uh, we need to fulfill on Canada's promises in Glasgow. Glasgow in Canada went out on a limb and we need to deliver. Um, and then we also need to increase Canada's ambition for the next COP in Egypt in November of this year. And we need to have Canada play a leading role in embedding the food system transformation into Canada's climate plan. plan. There's already steps in that direction. And that we need to up uphold Indigenous rights and work in partnership with Indigenous peoples. That, as I said, I've worked a lot with Indigenous peoples and it's so clear that they uh, offer uh, and they have historically offered such an important contribution. We wouldn't have even a chance of fighting this fight if they hadn't been protecting the forests that they have all over the world. So, uh, question for you, what else? Um, but um, should I go through all the last three slides and then come back? Um, next slide, and third to last. Um, what can we do at the provincial level? We need to end the fossil fuel infrastructure expansion, the bioenergy, the LNG, all that stuff. We need to get rid of subsidies, as I said earlier, and stop old growth. If there's one no-brainer on earth, when you've, you know, what's the expression when you've dug yourself into a hole, stop digging, when you've destroyed 99% of the old growth, stop doing it, you know, with the 1% left, but that, that, that's a climate issue, it's a biodiversity issue, it's, it's, a, it's a sanity issue. So, so that, that's just got to happen. And then um, we need smart growth planning for livable communities, energy efficient buildings, uh, sustainable transportation, uh, communities can develop their own energy. We also have to support indigenous priorities for housing, for adaptation. As I said, the indigenous peoples are, are going to be the uh, most severely hit uh, for adaptation and, and others. So that's a few thoughts. Next slide, um, which is uh, as Bowen. Um, continue Bowen's, I consider exemplary recycling, composting, um, uh, support the achievement of yesterday's newspaper that we should support the reducing emissions by 45% by 2030, that we should protect the remains of the Cape. Um, there's 300 acres that are not yet uh, uh, d done. We have to protect that Cape and prevent logging on, on Bowen's crown lands. Um, we need to explore, I was just talking to you about uh, exploring options for agroecological and regenerative agriculture on Bowen to demonstrate locally what a transformed food system looks like. And I don't know much about that, so we'll be hearing from an expert in a moment. Um, and then um, offer more plant-based options <laughs> in Bowen's restaurants. We need to walk the talk. And thanks to Joe, because I love the, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the noodle, ramen. the ramen noodle and the vegan burritos and the salads and all that stuff. So I want everybody to follow <laughs> Joe's example with more <laughs> like that. And, and what else? Last individual, what can we do as individuals? Uh, we can educate ourselves further. We can advocate on Bowen nationally and, and, and provincially and globally. We can support NGOs. Uh, I, I don't, I'm no expert on the NGOs in the world here, but I've seen that Canopy and Stand are doing great work. Greenpeace started here. Do you realize that Greenpeace yeah. started in British yeah. Columbia in, in the 70s? You guys lit the, lit the fuse on this whole movement. Um, and then we need to ensure our investment portfolios. I, I, I don't have a lot of money, but I have some stocks. I said to this guy who was helping me, I said, I don't want a penny of my money in fossil fuels. Get it the heck out. And, and, and he really argued with me for a while. I said, if you're going you're gonna to keep working with me, you're not, this is not optional. Um, and, uh, and then also, we should look at reducing our own per, per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Each of us, on average, produces 14.2 tons of CO2 per, per year. That's compared to 1.8 tons for an Indian citizen. That's almost a 10 to 1 difference. An Indian citizen lives their life and produces 1 8th, 9th, or 10th the greenhouse gas emissions than I do. What, what about that? So we need to really reduce that shifting diets, efficient you know, electric cars, and so on. 
Okay, so that's it. Um, actually, next slide. Uh, 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 look at this. When I was, this is, these are sunsets I found in the postcards of my grandparents. These photos of the sunset from the end of Mount Gardner Road. As I was leaving here, I looked out the window and it was exactly that. I wished I wasn't so late or I would have taken a picture and put it into the slideshow and it would have said, 102 years ago and today. Some things don't change too much, fortunately, and that, that's one. Okay, so uh, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. That's, the, that's what I had to say uh, to you. And now let's discuss a little bit and, uh, and, and I want to hear from you. Uh, There's another one. One more slide. <laughs> uh, 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 look at this. I just did this today. Tale of two cities, or tale of two islands. Bowen and Manhattan. Bowen is 19.3 square miles. Manhattan is 22.9 square miles. Almost the same, within 90%. This little island has, what, 4,000 people? This little island has 4 million. So this is a thousand times more distant than this. So this is, this is sort of the world I live in, these, the, the tale of two cities. I just put that for fun.